Hello. Hello. Hmm. Hey. Great to see you all. <clears throat> yeah. Nice to see everyone. Just a reminder to take a look around, see who's here, if you're called to do that. Hmm. So um, I thought we'd start with the quality of our awareness this morning. Yeah, I was going to say this morning, <laughs> today. Uh, uh, so let your attention just get settle in within your body or around the space around your body. And the, the instruction is to just to bring great care. It's like the apamata, the carefulness into being careful to um, be really identified with experience as me or I or mine. So it's that sense that the awareness isn't sticky. It doesn't have to be chained or tied to or stuck onto whatever's appearing. <clears throat> and if it is, if it is feeling tied or stuck, that we let the awareness open up around that. Allowing that, but actually seeing if we can at least unstick from that. That's like for the whole sitting, just to kind of have that as a theme, that sense of allowing resistance, allowing the sense of the awareness sticking or being identified with, but being aware of it, the quality of the awareness, being able to Keep stepping back and allowing, keep stepping back and allowing, and not being identified even with being identified, if possible. <laughs> mm. So, of course, this requires <clears throat> an intention for kindness. So, it's that shift from any kind of cold observation or a cold allowing of experience to, it's just a, a tweaking, a, a tweaking to the intention to be kind for life itself, for whatever's appearing moment by moment. Or care, you know, that, that sense of it can be compassion, whatever's easiest for us, the care, the tenderness, the vulnerability. It's 
So as we, for example, bring our awareness to hearing right now, Just see if the awareness can be even a little bit tender. Or that soft readiness for whatever sounds. that are appearing moment by moment. Then we might notice if the quality of the awareness softens out of this care or tenderness, kindness. often or at times the receiving of the textures, vibrations of silence and sounds. They're just a little more acceptable, accessible directly, not through the thought process. And that exquisite ease that can appear as well. Of understanding we don't have to control or manipulate or fix. Pleasant, unpleasant, or neutral feeling tone that's appearing with the sound, each sound. It's just letting, really letting things be just as they are. So we don't have to get rid of anything. It'll come and go by itself. And as we shift to our hands, body sensation. We can shift into that understanding of no inside, no outside, just receiving whatever's appearing within our hands. But noticing it never stays the same for more than a moment.
And then with the hmm, movement of our breath at our abdomen, again, never the same. Each moment. Allowing for that movement of the breath like the swells in the ocean. And just check to see, you check to see, can we <clears throat> allow this movement to come and go by itself, just as it is? Just as it's happening as best we can. And of course, with pleasant, unpleasant, neutral thoughts or emotions, never the same each moment. Often more easy to identify with. or believe we can control or believe we need to fix or manipulate, yet get something or get rid of something. So it's applying that understanding that ease we learn from sound, hands, breath. To the appearance of any thought, a plan, a memory, a judgment. Or any fear or joy. Sadness, happiness. Anger. Compassion. that ease of knowing we don't have to do anything with what's appearing. Except, importantly, the kindness, the care, the wisdom. Things are naturally unsticky. They come and go, all conditioned things come and go, just as they are.
Do you have any questions about your practice? Mm, Jesse's in Bolivia. I'm at home. <laughs> End of September, autumn, equinox. Hope you're all good. If you do have a, a question, um, you can just raise your hand with the, the Zoom hand with the reactions button on the bottom of your screen. I do. Patricia? Hi, Pat. Yeah. Hi. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know. How, I don't know what the hand is, but. Anyway. Yeah. So at the, anyway, it just, for anyone else, at the bottom of your screen, you sh there should be a button that says reactions. Oh, no, there's a little rate. <laughs> that's okay. We hear you. We can. Okay. Okay. So we can't see you if that's okay with you. Good. It's very okay. Uh, <laughs> if, if the, if if a focus is the rising and the falling of the abdomen, or that's a that's a a basis for you know <laughs> gaining stability anyway, then what is it actually that we're focusing on? Is it um, the pressure? Is it what is it? It's not the thought that the abdomen is rising and falling. It's what is it? Very good question. <laughs> it, it's um, the idea, and I be, <laughs> let's see if we have different answers to this. Is whatever, um, whatever we, whatever you notice as the direct sensory experience in the body of the that, that come with that experience of the rising and falling of the breath. Um, so it might be pressure. It might be the absence of pressure. It might be tightness, it might be the releasing of tightness, um, it might be heat, it might be coolness, you know. Um, but really, it's sort of like we are supposed to notice whatever it is. But right, not, it, it's not that it's wrong to notice the thought about the breath, because that's also to be noticed. But it is to be distinguished from the direct experience of the of physicality of, of breathing yeah in the abdomen and, and i think you you know you're you're also bringing up like just sort of the interesting question of like what's the is it just to stabilize the attention uh is it you know wh where is the sort of experience of insight in that and that it has everything to do with this yeah to kind of dance and co supporting of the aspects of concentration and mindfulness right so there is an aspect that um especially with the breath you know because it is recurring because it is it's it's consistent even though it's in, in constant right it's always changing but there's a consistency there a lot of the time for for many people um this idea that that it's it's there's always something there to observe right and that the that can build a sense of concentration um but that ultimately it's like trying to see these different experiences uh, the different sensations and also the the fact that they're changing the way that they're changing and 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 ultimately yeah to see how the mind is responding to to that awareness and what's the kind of dynamic there as well yeah. Michelle, anything you want to? Oh, you're muted there. Um, the, the concentration aspect of the breath is meant to be um, an anchor 
So that the, the, there can be times where that movement can be soothing and stabilizing, but also um, it's known concentration is known as a kind of solitude or rest. So that practice of coming back just over and over, coming back to something moving, as Jesse says, with some, with the continuity changing, but the continuity. The emphasis on the concentration is not in understanding the nature of the breath, of what's moving. You're not trying to understand the nature of it. You're you're like, uh, the the metaphor of anchor is that like if you're out at sea, <coughs> and particularly if one is lost, but just like uh, needing a safe harbor, that the 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 practice of learning how to stabilize the mind, heart, and body through the awareness of the movement of the breath is um, in some ways meant to be uh, restful. But it's not the rest of wisdom, it's the rest of concentration. But what's beautiful about it is that in any moment one can develop enough of the <clears throat> solitude and rest, uh, particularly from our aversion, attachment, and delusion, right? Our reaction to how things are. And out of that stabilization, um, one in a second can, can shift the awareness to understanding what it is that's moving, which is, it sounds like that's what you're asking. You know, it's like, but be careful of like, thinking that you have to approach this in any particular way. It's much more there'll be a, it's investigation when that light of investigation goes off and the mind, there's an interest in what is, what is the nature of the reality of this experience without going through the thought process. Right. That was great. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much, both of yeah. you. Yeah. Um, Arlene? Rob? Rob? It's actually Rob. Okay, hi Rob. <laughs> hi. hi. <laughs> how are you folks? Good. And how are you, Sandra? Glad to be with you. So, um, I have uh, uh, to some degree know how to concentrate and I know to some extent how to be mindful and I know if I need more energy how to well, sort of comes naturally more energy when I need it although lately last year or so, I've noticed that uh, sometimes energy takes no energy, which is probably not clear in language, but it's clear to me that sometimes there's energy, but it's taking no energy. But one thing I'm one thing, a thing that I uh, would like some help with is joy. I have, I often experience joy while I'm sitting. I find it's often connected to a really relaxed and feeling good body and a really relaxed and open mind and all of a sudden I find myself with a big grin on my face and I realize that I'm joyful. But I don't know how to work with joy to develop it like I've learned to develop some other factors uh, because I almost feel not almost, I sometimes feel 
uh, that I'm cheating by increasing, by <laughs> looking at joy and, oh, this is great, let's keep it off. But I, it, it's not quite that conscious, although in the background, maybe it is, it's hard. I don't know everything that's going on in there. But anyway, um, so if you could um, help me work with joy a little more. I mean, it's nice to have. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, can you say a little more about like what does happen when you, so you notice it, you know, and and what do you what do you do with it? How does it go? No, um, I'm meditating and I'm opening up to what's going on and <laughs> I'm seeing things or things are going fast and I don't actually know what they are. And I'm getting hooked every once in a while into thoughts or sensations, but a lot of the time I'm not. And if I am hooked, I just look at the hook. And at times then, when I'm doing that for a while, uh, I feel my body totally feel good. And um, not ecstatic, but really, uh, very pleasant. And then I, or at the same time, see the mind very relaxed in this energyless energy of, of looking, of curiosity, of wanting to know what truth is, in this very relaxed form of that, so that I'm just the 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 universe is is floating through and i get this big all of a sudden i feel super nice <coughs> and it's not that i'm i mean i've i think i've experienced first jhana it's nothing like that it's not an ecstasy or rising my cushion above the floor but it's uh just oh, boy, this is wonderful. Or I, I don't think those words come, but I just feel really good. And I get this big grin on my face that only I know is there. But uh, so I don't know if I can do better than that. Right, no, but okay, then, and then what happens? So what oh, happens? Then what happens? Yeah. Oh, so I, oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> and then, sorry. Yeah. Uh, then I watch TV. Uh, no, mm -hmm. I, um, uh, then it, uh, it, uh, disappears after a while and mm -hmm. I'm just back uh, I'd say most well with a combination of of of, uh, of uh, mindfulness and paying attention and and uh, it might come for instance it's less sitting right now three times during that period, I had this great feeling of joy. And then I went back to more or less regular meditation, sometimes getting hooked on a thought or a sensation and sometimes not. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great, great. I have some thoughts, Michelle. I don't know if you want to jump in first. Oh, yeah. no, go ahead and then I'll jump in. Yeah. Yeah. <clears throat> I... You know, Rob, I think it sounds great. And I, and I think you're, I, my, the, the feeling I have is like you're, you're encountering a part of, you're encountering like a, a really beautiful and important place of like, that you're, that when it comes down to it, you're more interested in wisdom than feeling good and that to understand that that's like um you know that i think that we're gonna val we're gonna like valorize that as something that's like you know really healthy and wholesome and, and ultimately you know the deeper the deeper motivation for our practice and and everything that kind of lines up around um uh you know getting liberated and 
but there is this sort of funny way that we also realize like, well, there's a lot to explore in our practice, right? It's, and that there are these beautiful mind states that are available and that can be cultivated. And it's just sort of interesting when you see the part of yourself that on one hand would like to explore these things and get to know them better and, and, and in a clean way, right? It's not just, you know, of course there's places where we're attached and we want to feel good. And there's also the place where it's like, this is amazing. And it's an interesting part of our meditation practice. And, and then you can encounter these places in which they arise, you appreciate them and you're not hooked on it and it disappears and you go back into your practice. And then, and then to see that, like actually just or going back into more of your mindfulness based practice, right. And the, the Vipassana aspect of things. And as you get quiet and it kind of reemerges and then it dissipates and it reemerges. Um, so I think just to say that that is like a really lovely way to practice and there's no need to do anything different. And if you wanted to do something different, you basically have to be willing to let go of some of the wisdom. That's a, maybe a little bit of a strong way of saying it, right? But it's something true about that, right? Which is like, if you want to explore this as more of a kind of like realm of the mind, you do have to let go a little bit, like Michelle, was, she was describing the concentration where you're not really investigating the nature of something. You have to... <laughs> a little bit um, uh, like uh, let go of that impulse, which is a cultivated and trained and kept up for many years. <laughs> and so it's just like willingness to be like, okay, well, if, if you want to explore that, then there is this sense of like, okay, what is it like to, when this mind state arises, what is it like to, to hang out in it? and actually sort of bring a little bit more intention to just the sense of like getting a little more engrossed in that experience and and just seeing where that goes i don't you're in a, you're it's arising naturally enough that i wouldn't say you know you have to start repeating phrases or, or or doing anything like really tightening of the mind it's like but you can sort of like let go a little bit of the investigative quality that you're bringing to your practice and just sort of what is it like to kind of hang out and chances are it'll last a little longer. It could last a lot longer, but it, you know, you'll, you'll just sort of give it a little bit more sort of sense of like, what is it like to feel into this and to hang out in this mind space, mind state for a little bit longer um, and see, you know, I mean, I think that there might be some place where you, it does start to become almost distasteful to you because your, your mind is going to want to go back to not controlling things that much. Right. And, um, not being sort of that absorbed into something that's not as connected to the truth of, you know, our lived experience. But it doesn't mean that you shouldn't practice it and explore it because there, there are all these cool things to explore in our practice. And, and why not sort of give yourself a little bit of sense of like what that training might be like at this point in your practice without worrying that you're going to like, you know, get too consumed with like, I'm now I'm just want to be in these absorptive states or whatever. It's like just to be willing to explore it. You know, that's my sort of thank you impulse. Yeah, uh, Michelle. It sounds like you're going in the direction of mindfulness of mudita, maybe. Is that right, Jesse? Or, yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the question of it. I mean, the, the, the question of mindfulness or all, I mean, yes, I think you, right. but right. So let me, right. I just want right. to jump into that, that yeah. just a little bit more because sometimes that, that inner smile is, can be very sublime and doesn't necessarily need investigation. It just needs to be understood as sublime and not um, not dependent on any experience uh, other than that it's coming from usually an equanimity a, you know a, a non clinging mind you know that it <clears throat> I don't think there's anything you have to do with it and you know that as Jesse's saying and um, investigating it from a, an equanimous place would tend to shift it probably to more neutral. 
that's what as Jess that's what Jesse is basically saying is that it's going to shift it usually to more more neutral uh, because you wouldn't be sticky with it it would come and go um, and there there is a choice that you could and as Jesse's saying you don't have to um, step on the gas with the mudita but you could understand that there is a way you can appreciate um, the joy. So mudita is an appreciation of, in this case, you could, exp you could be mindful of mudita, meaning you could be mindful of appreciating that joy. And that can also be very sublime. It doesn't have to be something sticky as well. It's just a, it's a choice of where... Um, the mind might choose to bring in a Brahma Vihara there to um, cultivate the appreciation of the joy. <laughs> and 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 when I somehow if i'm doing that which i've probably done a little of and the thought comes up that i get stuck on for a few seconds anyway that i'm cheating that i'm trying to cultivate joy for joy's sake and not to understand joy but i don't think cultivating joy for joy's sake is necessarily a bad thing after all it's a factor of of alignment and so I, I i i guess the the it's like a long time ago you know i had one of the several of these experiences of great light and all that and i always thought well maybe it's first john or maybe it isn't i never never i, I have no idea but anyway and i had to just back off doing that i mean that came from concentration only and I had to back off because I thought I'd get addicted to it. And so, I, so I think that it, uh, and I haven't done it since. I haven't concentrated that hard since, and so, or just concentrated. And so I, I guess that's a little bit of what I'm fearing. I'll yeah, fear. yeah. Well, and it's it's a trusting, it's a trusting that through going through the practice of this that you will learn what what a pure motivation with it is and what isn't. So like sometimes you have to be willing to go through a fear of getting addicted to it um, to actually being able to taste actually a purity of motivation with it. So that that is ultimately with um, mudita, it's an antidote to addiction. Because rather than getting lost in the joy and addicted to it, one's, one's actually still turning on it and appreciating it rather than getting stuck in it, right? So it's, it's actually an ability to, you can shift it to a, bring so much wisdom into it because in terms of there is pleasure, there is pain, there is neutral, and that, there, that fear of getting hooked on it, of course, is a really relevant fear. We all, I mean, it's like bottom line, homo sapien, 101, dukkha, right? And so, you, you know, obviously, it's a, it's, a wise, it's a wise fear, and it's like dabbling in a little bit of um, mudita when you're, you're coming from such an equanimous place. The, um, in the Brahma Viharas, equanimity is what protects or guards metta and karuna and mudita. Equanimity is the guard, it's the protector. So that if it, you can play, you can experiment with all this and just see is this, um, if there's a willingness not to do it perfectly and to, to actually practice mudita, right? You're practicing mudita. And we can never do any of these things perfectly without a lot of practice. And even then the idea isn't perfection, it's practice so that it's learning how to, it could be that for half a minute you, you see what it would be like to um, shift. To, it's actually mindfulness, it's mindfulness of mudita. 
Okay. And then shift into being equanimous with it. Like, right, you go back and forth so that you're... But ultimately, I would encourage you to trust your motivation here. No, oh, that's hard. But <laughs> thank you. Yeah, but it is. I, can I, I, I think yeah, there's yeah. like, you know how you were saying, Rob, in the beginning of like this kind of energy that doesn't, it's almost irrecognizable as energy because it's not, it's, it doesn't take force. You know, it doesn't, it's right. like, and so you don't, it's like you, you realize that there's this thing that's called energy that doesn't feel like what you thought energy is supposed to feel like. It's like the, the, there's an interesting thing, the aspect of this where it's like, it can feel like that voice saying, should you be doing this is like the voice of mindfulness, right? But but there's another way of like, well, is it just doubt, right? right? And and I, it might be one in one moment and mindfulness in another or whatever. It's not that it's gonna be that clear, but to consider that too of like, that sometimes we're identified more with the voice, with the sort of negative voice that we associate with wisdom but that actually is just a kind of another defense around doubt or have these other flavors. And, you know, um, sometimes this kind of thing can help you get a, a perspective on the mindfulness piece, right. And on the more Vipassana wisdom piece, because you're, you're being confronted with sort of certain voices from that, that are, um, that you get a different angle on, you know? Yeah. Beautiful. Thank you. Great. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Hmm. I've always wanted to say this, and I think hmm. this might be the time where I might not disturb too many people's practice if you're not too quiet. But okay, here's a. It, it it's showing my age, so a lot of you might not know this commercial if you're a certain age. But there was a. Um, Tony the Tiger. Do you know Tony the Tiger? Okay. Like and Frosted Flakes? Yeah, Frosted Flakes. You know Tony? And he would say, oh, good, I'm getting to finally, you know, I've been building up to this my whole life. So Tony the Tiger would say, um, can't get enough of that sugar, crisp, <laughs> sugar, crisp, sugar, crisp. And that's what I think we're all afraid of, right? Like, you know, so... <laughs> <laughs> Man, he really could say it just perfectly. Frosted flakes, man, you know. So that was the 60, 50s, the 50s and 60s. <laughs> but it's true. It's like, you know, sometimes there's joy. And it's okay. Like It's like we're not meant to like not experience it. It's that we're afraid to get hooked into it or the experience that's uh, uh, making space for that to arise. And that's like part of the practice is learning how to put ourselves through it. And, and not just afraid of getting hooked, but afraid of losing ourselves. And, yeah. And, and that there is something, you know, that, that, that is to, you know, to lose ourselves in something kind of blissful or positive feeling the way that that can, you know, some people are really, like that's what they're signing up for right they're hoping that that's going to happen but there's there's like a lot of people that where it's like that's a scary thing you know and so that there's a way that the mind itself is going to like kind of put on the brakes from that happening and that that is a you know a mechanism of self self-defense um that's something that you know really can take quite a while to soften soften you know yeah. And if you don't know Tony the Tiger, you could always YouTube it. If you could just get a box of <laughs> <laughs> right, that's better. That's better. <laughs> sugary cereal. You'll totally know <laughs> everything that Michelle's trying the, to say. The jingle. You'll know why the jingle is so powerful. <laughs> a bowl of frosted flakes. <laughs> Hi, Nicole. Hi, Nicole. Hi. Is it okay if I keep my camera off? Of course. Sure. Just, um, oh, I don't even know. 
know exactly what my question is, but I think I think some of the language you guys were just using about clinging helped. I think my mind is just clinging so much lately and it's causing a lot of suffering, but there's also suffering underneath that. <laughs> like I tried to do a self retreat um, over a weekend and there was just so, so much sadness came up at once. Um, and in general, I just feel like we all have our different um, I don't know, like I have a spiritual friend and she has a lot of physical ailments, right? And we and that's kind of how her maybe dukkha manifests. But for me, it's very emotional. Um, and sometimes I just have trouble separating out all of the the things. <laughs> I don't know if this is making sense. Um, yeah. Just on a day-to-day -day sort of basis. Um, and it almost feels like the more I practice, the less I kind of get along in the world and that, that can be kind of hard. Um, so I don't, I think I'm just looking for a word of encouragement um, at this juncture. <laughs> um, yeah. I, I just think that, um... You know, this is coming from, I feel like, knowing you enough to, um, say that when one is a more introverted, sensitive type that has more access to vulnerability in a positive way and, uh, more you know, really working hard at your practice, then I think that um, if you look at just 2023 <laughs> and what it's like to kind of navigate it for any of us, never mind um, all the ways that the Buddha taught, like that, I mean, he basically taught that being a householder was too hard. Mm. I mean, it's very important. I think, I mean, I take great refuge in that, that, that like that there was a reason he encouraged people to be monks and nuns. I'm not saying that we all uh, can do that or that that was what, um, how things went in, in a more um, Western Dhamma like, um, unfolding but I think you need I would I would actually give you a lot of encouragement for um, trying to navigate this time period with such a um, deep practice <laughs> you know it's I don't think it's gonna necessarily make things easier and I think that's um, a bummer <laughs> You know, I mean, I just think it's a bummer that it doesn't make it easier, but I wouldn't want to fool you to think it it should, or necessarily should, or would, because how could it? How could it um, not be something that would bring up a lot of grief or, or anger? You know, like this... Even if you were paying attention 1% of the time of, of what's going on, never mind, I mean impersonally, never mind anything personal, but just um, the only protection, we can offer the protection of the factors of awakening, the Brahma Viharas, you know, the guardian meditation, we can offer the, all the protection we can. And... Um, to navigate the world where we're not where we're not able to practice those all the time uh, makes you more open 
but not necessarily more equanimous, right? So that usually for people more like your type, the opening is going to happen faster than the equanimity can keep, keep up. And so I think it's more just encouraging you that being sad all weekend is okay. Like, you know, that that <laughs> might not, mm, you might yeah. not have liked it. You <laughs> might not have liked it, but to me it sounds like a great way to recover. Like to just like, of course, if you had had a week that would have come and gone and there would have been other things that could have come in to stabilize more. But that, to me, that's a good, to me, like if more people should be crying personally, I just think it's, I think it's great, you know, that, that you could put yourself through that and feel all that and like that's a noble thing to do not a it's just you didn't have enough time to like um have anything else happen much right yeah yeah and um at you know at the risk of sharing too much but just because i think it's helpful for people because this you know tradition especially i think we gravitate towards it because there is this, this this psychology and this mental kind of aspect to it. Um, and I am I am on medication for the first time, and that's really I'm, I don't have a lot of equanimity with that, and um, it feels like the emotions are still there's lot there's less fear there's less like there, there's less maybe primal emotions. And those were the ones I was maybe working with more. So I'm just kind of struggling with the change and the shift to a, a different landscape too. Um, hmm. So. Well, that adds, right? That adds another dimension that is part of why it's hard. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Especially since you're okay. like, you are sensitive to the changes, you know, and, and hard if it's like <laughs> helping with sort of one aspect of the landscape and then there's like another aspect of the landscape that kind of comes into more focus you know exactly yeah yeah i mean i, I guess i'll just add a couple of things around it's like michelle saying i'm like it doesn't always mean that it's coming with a lot of equanimity you know i mean it's just to remind us that like the this practice is designed to put us in touch with the like totally undependable constantly changing incoherent nature of everything you know including our own minds and our own bodies and the idea is in the right conditions which are not like a static thing right there are some basic formulations that we understand about what are supportive conditions but in the right conditions that truth is developing along the more or less along the same timeline as the okayness with that <laughs> you know so yeah. like th this sense of like why we practice in you know a more protected space or not reading or not engaging in the world because it's like you need enough protection to and and supportive conditions externally and internally to be able to handle the truth emotionally and psychically right um to make it lead to wisdom rather than just upsetness in its many forms you know mm. um and i think what you're you know just like the heroism of right like trying to do a weekend retreat in the middle of like a very busy schedule in the middle of a lot of other stuff going on in your life and in the world you know it's like to get that that's like really valiant and at the same time to that we also learn these places of like where are we setting ourselves up for, for a certain kind of uh on whatever expectation that we might have had for what a weekend retreat might look like that might not have been realistic if you consider that right if you consider actually what is it the way is kind of Michelle saying, it's like it can actually feel very dysfunctional to get more mindful in our daily lives. 
and that that is contrary to so much of the narrative about how mindfulness is supposed to be like helpful with everything but it's not true right it's like actually it's like it's it's like everything is totally unstable and it's like oh is that is that a relaxing weekend really you know not always you know and it's like it's cool to get <laughs> that you like try to do it uh but then there is this question of like okay so so that had its own impact there are factors going on in your life that may have influenced that but it's like so what do we do then like what what are the different way in the future that if you were to do another kind of weekend retreat how might you structure it in a way that you are like m- mitigating that to some degree so that you're not just like i don't know how you you know structure your retreat but you know you don't have too high expectations about like sitting walking sitting walking sitting walking you know that you 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 are involving like pleasant experiences maybe it's a less kind of hardcore formal retreat and you know you're bringing in things that are a little more softening you know um whatever reading movie um comedy frosted flakes frosted flakes i think mm. sometimes michelle feels <laughs> like are, can be helpful did you so watch did you watch did you watch any comedies nicole I did at night. I okay. The first day I tried, like Jesse, you're saying I tried much too hard, and then I called a a friend, and you know she t- told me to take a bath and do some other things, and that really helped. But um, so the second day was like very different mm-hmm. <laughs> than the first day. Very cool. That's great. Um, I think the only other thing I'll say is like you know that when you when we are in like karmic not land which is Mm -hmm. like very familiar patterns of belief that we experience in the heart mind belief about ourselves belief about the world usually negative um there 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 is just some place where we have to recognize that like we can't trust our minds that that mm-hmm. and, and there is this place of like when something feels so familiar and it has a little bit of flavor of your as you're describing so i don't know if it's true but the sense of like there's something that feels so familiar about certain mind states or certain yes. views about yes. ourselves we are like mm-hmm. this feels like home and this is the truth and it's bad you know it's a it's a negative truth um when that's true it's like you just you have to be like you cannot believe the view it is a trick it is <laughs> <laughs> it is this thing that we have developed to create a sense of security in a really in a, in a such an unpleasant way, but it's a solidity, right? You if to start to see that like oh this feels so solid, and the solidity of it has to be a cue for like not trusting it, right? That it can't mm-hmm. be that real if it's that solid because it means that you're just you're building something up, and um, you know you have to be delicate with it. It's not like just sort of like cutting it off, but there's some place where it's like getting a little bit of breathing room from this sort of like little world of negative views um, that feels so comfortable in its way um, that can sometimes be helpful of just like, oh, getting just just a millimeter of distance from it can be really helpful. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that, wow, that helps a lot. Yeah. It sounds like you did well, like you sounds like you kind of started drowning and you called, you reached out and you, mm started shifting and it it sounds like you did well with it to me Uh, i think it's that sense of like the sadness is okay and there's the acceptance of it or the resistance to it that will come and go but i think that that sense of if you're drowning like jesse's saying if it's drowning in the karmic knot learning how to pull out and change the channel um you know as a form of metta right Mm -hmm. like the like having that sense of the metta and compassion, reinforcing that by shifting shifting the channel is so, it's good practice, Nicole. Even, even day-to-day, sort of day-to-day. You, day-to-day. you yeah. bet, you bet. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. day-to-day yeah. is whether, you know, on retreat, off retreat, it's not, it's the question is really how are we regulating drowning <laughs> yeah okay <laughs> it sounds really it sounds that sounded really good you know how are we regulating drowning yeah <laughs> okay 
Thank you both. Yeah. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. Yeah. Thank you. And thank you to the sangha. I feel mm. very, very grateful for the sangha. Mm. And I, I just I do want to say like because you know the, in the past this has arisen a few times, but just to folks like if you ever don't want to show your video, it's fine. And if you ever like ask a question and you feel like actually you don't want it to be public and, you know, cause we do tend to put these on online, just let us know, you know, send an email or you can let us know in chat or tell it whatever. Um, and we can, you know, edit the video. So things are not always out there. Cause we do want it to feel safe for people to feel like they can, um, you know, get your express what you need to express and get your question answered. And um, yeah, so just, and if in three months you realize you would rather not have it be public, we can do it then too. Yeah. Hmm. All right, everyone. Hmm. So I, I'm going to try to be on the Zoom next week. I'm starting a self retreat, um, right, kind of like the next Sunday. Um, there's a little bit of question about the internet connection where I'll be. So um, I'll try to join you with Michelle. Um, and yeah. And if not, if not I'll <laughs> I see will you be. in the beginning of November. <laughs> It'll be Michelle. Yeah. Da, 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 da. <laughs> Take care, everyone. Mm. Yeah. Good luck out there. <laughs> mm.